on in this series called Level Up. Everyone say Level Up. Level Up. We'll get there. I'll give you a couple more opportunities to get on the train here today. And uh, week four, I want to go to the book of Hebrews. Everyone say Hebrews. I said it when we went to this book a few weeks ago. If you wonder why we have free Stone Creek coffee out there, we believe that we should brew because Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, to the life of faith. Everyone say faith. We're in this series where we're believing that in order to level up in life, we've got to level up our faith. Amen? So let us strip now every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. On who? Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith he initiates it somebody say he started it he started it you may have think you found jesus he found you if you like me i I might take credit for it but in the in reality i was crippled up i didn't have a way of making a way to god and he found me says that he started it and i love this word he perfects it which means he completes it guess what our job if our job isn't to start it our job isn't to finish it guess what our job is to live it to enjoy it, to walk in it. Y'all ever put a pizza in the, the oven and forgot to set a timer? Anyone like me? Anyone? Anyone? What happened to the pizza? It got burnt. He, it got burned. Why? Because the cooking process had completed, but the pizza complete, uh, continued to cook. Some of us have burnt out faith because we're trying to finish something that God already completed. We ain't even to the first point, y'all. Let's go after it today. Y'all with me? Let's do this together perfects it because of the joy awaiting him he endured the cross disregarding its shame now he is seated in the place of honor besides God throne think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people then you won't become weary and give up man we could stop right here if we just spent a little bit more time thinking about the price that Jesus paid when you when when we got annoyances and and frustrations at work or in the family if we just stopped for a second and went Man, all that you went through for me. It might bring some things into perspective. Week four of Level Up, I want to talk about the motivation that moves me. The motivation that moves me. We are a brave church. We believe in community. We believe in connections. And so, before you are seated, I need you to be brave enough to high five five people, which means you probably got to get outside your row. I need you to high five five people. I need you to tell them in the least creepy voice, you move me. You move me. High five five people. Tell them you move me. Thank you so much, worship team. We doing all right? Yeah. Motivation, motivation. Y'all believe that motivation matters? Y'all know that motivation matters? Have you ever tried to uh, start a diet just because? How'd that go for you? <laughs> you ever tried to stop eating those sweets just because? How'd that go for you? I was driving to, to work the other day. I said, I am not going to stop at Cranky L's Donuts and pick myself up a donut. I asked myself why. I couldn't come up with an answer. I stopped and picked up a dozen. <laughs> Which, for the record, I do not eat Cranky L's often, but when I do, I eat it every week. <laughs> you tried to uh, save more money, give more money away, spend less just because? How'd that go for you? 
said no world-changing philanthropist ever. I just gave my money away. I don't know why. Everyone say why. Motivation matters. What's your motive? And yet, I don't know about you, but I found that that motivation's kind of gotten a bad rap lately. That we can sometimes downplay, overlook, and, and sometimes criticize the concept of motivation. I was uh, chatting with a buddy of mine when we first moved back to Wisconsin, uh, which again, a lot of first time guests here today, thankful for that. My wife and I, we uh, came from Columbus, Ohio, back to Wisconsin to help start this church, and I was meeting with a buddy, and I was going on and on about Brave. It was just an idea at that point, and I was like, man, it's going to be great. We're going to get fired up, man. I'm, I'm going to wear camo pants, and they're going to be maybe a little bit too tight, but it's going to be awesome, and, and uh, you know, we, we believe that people should feel something. They should come into church. They should get, you know, they should really get fired up. And he stopped me for a second. He said, are, are, is Brave going to be like, and then he compared um, it to uh, another church. I ain't going to name because you probably heard it. He's like, is it going to be like church? And I stopped for a second. I was like, I was like, what, what do you mean? He said, well, I've heard. Everyone say, I've heard. I've heard danger signs. Real quick, danger signs. If your opinion starts with, I've heard something, read a blog, watch something on the news, stop. Anyways, he said, I heard that they've gotten motivational. And of course, I looked at him and I said, no, they couldn't. And in part, I can, I can kind of um, relate to him because there seems to be a surplus of motivational content nowadays and yet a deficit of movement there is a, a surplus of motivational content, podcast, books, whatever your necessary motivational pump up the jams, music that you need just to get to the gym. We got motivational content, but how many of y'all know that there, there seems to be a deficit of actually progress, moving forward? I, uh, I'm almost done with a book called Atomic Habit, and in the book, the... Uh, the author talks about how there's a difference between having the motivation to the level of, of motion, he calls it, motion, and having a motivation that actually moves you. He talks about how, how, how motion feels good. It feels good. Motivation. We, like, we, like the motiv we motivate ourselves to, to motion where we make plans. We write them down. Mm, that's good. We, 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 we like the motion of, of, of talking about our goals. You sit down with someone for two hours, and that's what I'm going to do this year. Mmm, that feels good. And, 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 yet, and yet, with all that motion, there, there seems to be a, um, a dissonance between actually taking some action steps. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all falling in love with a little bit of motion, maybe? The, the author, James Clear, he says, that, um, he says that he loves the motion of researching for a book. Loves that, researching for a book, but, but it's the sitting down and writing something that terrifies him. We like the, the motion of making some goals and maybe even posting about them to Facebook, but it's the, it's the uncertainty of progress that sometimes stalls us out. Seems to be a difference between moving forward and getting stuck in the motion of things. I've been asking myself this question all week. I'd love to pose it towards your way. Do you have the level of faith that is motivated to movement or is your faith just going through the motions? Mm, we're going to have church today, y'all. Buckle up. It's going to be one of those types of sermons. Motions of faith. Y'all know what about the motions of faith. Worship can be a motion. Worship can be a motion, right? So it feels good. Right? I hope it. I mean, y'all got Matt up here, Grace up here, full band somewhere back there that's playing drums. And, and it's good. It's good to be right here. Jesus. Oh, your presence. I just want to stand here. Just be here all day. And then God speaks to you while you're in worship about forgiving the coworker for what they said about you. I just want to stay right here, Jesus. Just better is one day right here better is one day than thousands elsewhere. Don't lead me out there into the cold. I want to stay right here. Got the motion of worship. You know, going to church can be a motion. 
And hear me out, I am not saying don't come to church. That is not what I'm trying to tell you. I did not come back to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to leave that one out in the open, all right? But it can become a motion where we can go to church, go to church, go to church, and resist change, and resist change, and resist change. The motions of faith when it's easier to Pinterest about it than it is to practice it. One of my favorite types of motions, I've been so guilty of this one so much in my life, is the motion of commotion. <laughs> we talk, 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 talk. How many of y'all know that it is, it is quite possible to be the loudest person in the room and yet the least connected to a faith that moves? Now, I know it's not you, so just think about that family memory of yours. Oh, yep, I got them. They should have been here. I'm going to text them. I'm thinking about you today. <laughs> I got the motions of faith. I, uh, I once heard a pastor say that um, the door of opportunity is motion activated. I love that. And I think it's true. I think it's true. I think it is motion activated. I think that there is something powerful that happens when we get into worship and we begin to lean our thoughts and our hearts in the direction of Jesus. I do think that there's something powerful. There's a spark that happens at church, in community. I think we should talk about our faith. But do not be misled, little brave church. The door of opportunity may be motion activated, but it takes some movement to actually walk through, which is why I kind of hate and love this text that we're going through today. Do you think I like preaching on everything that I, like, that I preach about? I hope you don't like. But I was in Hebrews 12, and I was like, man, it was starting to sting me a little bit. Because here the writer of Hebrews is compelling us not just to enjoy the motions of motivation, but rather to motivate our faith to the level of, of movement. And he cites his source of movement by saying this. Let's throw it back up there. Verse 1. Since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of, of witnesses. That's what's motivating his, his faith. Since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, if you want to do a little Bible study this week and get a little bit of motivation, you could rewind back to Hebrews 11, where he talks about this crowd of witnesses. He, he goes through a bunch of individuals whose lives were marked by a faith that moves. I like one of the guys that he was talking about. He talked about Moses. Y'all know about Moses, right? Built the ark. And, um, and so how long were you going to let me get away with that? Y'all, my goodness. You were just going to let me run with that? I don't know where he's going, but let's see. <laughs> Moses led millions of people out of Egyptian slavery into freedom, Moses. And Hebrews 11 talks about that. It does. But the part that really, really caught my eyes was, was when it describes Moses and it says Moses who refused to be identified as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You see, Moses was born to a Hebrew slave. But y'all know the story. She had to put him in the Nile River. He flowed up. Pharaoh's daughter came out. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And, and so she adopted him. And yet Moses grows up and he, he chooses not to identify with royalty, but he chooses to stick to who he really is in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew lineage. And you want to know what that motivates me, y'all? I think that should motivate us to stay true to who you are. I think that that, that, gets, that gets in my heart. It motivates me to know who I am and stick to it. It should motivate us to say, I am a son of Christ. I am a daughter of God. And that's who I am. Because here's the thing. Only when we embrace our identity as God's children can we experience the calling of God. Somebody say, take it back. Take it. Oh, my goodness. We got to get on the same page. Somebody say, take it back. Take it back. So, so you might have some things in your past that have been trying to define you. But guess what? Under the power of God, you can take your identity back. You, you, might, you might have done some things. You might have some, some perspectives that people have of you, and you've let them rob you of who you are, but it's time to take it back. You might have a, a, a less than, than pleasing job title. You might have some broken dreams on your resume, but they don't define you. They don't own you. They don't get to hold who you are captive. It's time to what? Take it back. 
So I'm going to take it back. Y'all motivated yet? All right, we'll get there. I'm motivated by Moses. I'm also motivated by another person that Hebrews talks about. It talks about Rahab. Everyone say Rahab. Now, you might know about Moses, but you might not know about Rahab. Rahab, don't, she don't get a lot of stage time. Nope. Our brave kids' curriculum, to my knowledge, is not spending a lot of in-depth study on Rahab because uh, Rahab's profession was that of a prostitute. Mm-hmm. And now before we do what churches do, oh my gosh, I couldn't imagine. Now, we might not be able to empathize with her specific industry, but I'm sure we can all relate to selling ourselves out for everything from a relationship to a career path. Rahab. Rahab's not like Elisha, who we spent a whole series on, the great man of God, Elisha, in 2 Kings. He, she, she, she's not like David, who was a giant slayer. I'll know about David. She's not like Samson, who was the he-man of, of biblical times. It just says that Rahab, by faith, was a prostitute who welcomed Israelite spies into her home. She, she allowed people of God to come into her home so that they could strategically plan out how they were going to take her city. That's all it says about her. What's interesting is that in verse 31 of Hebrews 11, where it mentions Rahab's story, David and Samson barely get an honorable mention in the next verse. It just says, and then there were some other guys, David, Samson, and Elisha doesn't even get named. Here's why that motivates me. It motivates me to know that for all of my imperfections, for all of my mistakes that I've made, that my story can shift in one singular moment of surrender. Y'all motivated by that? That motivates me. It motivates me, and I think this is a word for someone if it's not just me. It motivates me to know that that it's not my job to, to clean up my past. It's not my job to step into my own PR. We've got to clean this up. It's not my job to sanitize my situation. That's Jesus' job. He don't need any help. He's just asking us to surrender to him. I'm motivated by Moses. I'm motivated by Rahab. And uh, the Hebrews writer was motivated as, as well. But he wasn't motivated to motion Hebrews writer wasn't, mm, let's, just, let's just spend two-year Bible study on Rahab, okay? Let's just stay right here, all right? But he was motivated to movement. Says this, let's go back to our, our text. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us what? Run. run. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us, I've got three very, very practical points. We're getting practical, y'all, today, all right? Practical points that I believe will help us motivate our faith to the level of movement. And the first point is so theologically deep. I hope you can handle it, okay? Point one, I think we need to be motivated to the point of moving and, and running with it. Run with it. Somebody say, run with it. Run with it. The writer compares the life of faith to that of a runner who runs a race. He doesn't say that, that, that it's, it's like a battle. We have a lot of battles in the Bible. So you've all read probably a passage about a battle in the Bible. He doesn't say that it's like a battle. He doesn't say that, he doesn't say, compare it to, to the great struggle and wrestling match. He says that, he said that it is, faith is like running a race. This is a key point that we need to get because sometimes we are content to define and confine our life of faith to the struggles with no expectation that God wants to lead us somewhere. We got to go somewhere. For all that, we talk about David and preach about David. And I love David. I love going to 1 Samuel 17 and talking about the giant. I love that. But, but like David wasn't caught in a time loop. Y'all probably never seen Edge of Tomorrow, Tom Cruise movie. I'm not endorsing it. But David wasn't waking up to experience the same thing over and over and over. David wasn't waking up, oh, running out to the battle. Oh, my goodness. Sleeping, waking up, oh my gosh, throws again. He wasn't stuck in a, a time loop. He faced a giant, but rather it says that David was motivated to run out to the giant, not because his life was, was all about the struggles, but here's what motivated David to run out towards the giant. It's because he saw the giant as an obstacle in light of his anointing to be future king. He knew that God was leading him somewhere. He knew that God was taking him somewhere. And so if this giant is going to stand in my way, here's, here's why it's important that we know this, is because when you know um, that God is leading you somewhere, it will help you interpret your struggles. 
Pastor Jonathan, who is here from Cornerstone, one of the first people that welcomed me to Milwaukee, good friend of mine. He was preaching about this uh, yesterday at a conference we were at. He was talking about how, how when Jesus says that you are going to the other side of the lake, don't be surprised if a storm swells up in the middle of it. Why? Because Jesus said you're going to the other side. He's leading us somewhere. Somebody say run with it. We got to run with it. We might have some giants and we got to deal with those giants. But I'm starting to view the giants in my life as just being something that I got to face while I'm on the way to something greater. There might be some problems and some issues in my life. That's fine. I can deal with that. But I'm not staying here because I am running a race of faith. And my faith has a finish line. His name is Jesus. And because Jesus is my finish line, this can't finish me. Woo! I don't know about you, but it helps me to know that because Jesus is my ending, this will not be the end of me. I love that. That's motivating. Let's run with it, church. Run with it. We got to run with it. And, and this is such an important context because when you know the activity, the, the performance, the, the, the um, sport that you are participating in, it, it helps determine your preparation. You ain't coming in here. We have in church. It helps you to, by the way, just full context, a lot of things happening at this school today. Judo tournament, okay. We got a, a, a play that's happening here, all right. Anyways. <laughs> oh, righty, where was I? It'll determine your preparation. When you know that you're running a race, it'll determine how you prepare. And, and so here's, here's what Here's what the, the writer says. He says that since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let's go there. Here we go. Let us, let us, give me that verse, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us. Uh, point two, I need a motivation that moves me to let it go. Let it go. The writer, uh, he, he, he brings up two different types of deterrence that are likely um, to come into our race of faith. And the first restriction is that of a weight. A weight. One scholar puts it this way. I thought this was so good. I, I want to pay him some um, respect by reading this so I don't mess it up. He, he refers to the weight as the harmless and otherwise useful things. Everyone say useful. Useful. Harmless and oftentimes useful things that would positively, I love this, slow us down. It will, it will definitely hold you back. And furthermore, the same weight that a runner might use to strengthen themselves for the race can be their downfall if they carry it out into the race. Mm -hmm. lean, for the, lean in for this. There are things that God will utilize in one season to grow you, and then in the next season, he'll tell you to let it go. Some friends of ours took us out to a really great restaurant. And, and the thing that made this restaurant so good was that it, was, um, it had a seasonal menu. Seasonal menu. They said, we ain't, we, we're going to give you the freshest ingredients here. We ain't flying things in. We local, homegrown. A seasonal menu. You know, you know where, where, where this is going. God's ways are on a seasonal menu. There are dreams that God will use in one season of our lives to, to drive us and motivate us, but that same dream can be a lid if we're not willing to let it go after God changes our trajectory. There are people and relationships that are in your life for a season, for a reason, but they can be a constraint if you don't let them go when God leads you elsewhere. When Jackie and I first came to Milwaukee, I, I grew up in Milwaukee. I've been here for 24 years, been gone for six years. We're coming back to launch this church. And, um, and I was thinking, man, all those friends that I had. I can't wait to see who's excited about Brave Church. Oh, man, I, you know, all friends I went to school with. I was in a band. The regardless, I think our MySpace is still up. I'm thinking, oh, who's gonna, they're going to be so pumped up. And then we had our first interest night, and none of them showed up. <laughs> and so I did what any young pastor would do. I went home and cried and cried and cried. Where are they, Jesus? I grew up here. I grew up here, Jesus. I mentored him. He won't even talk to me now. 
Where are the Jews? And, and Jesus says, they're not on the menu anymore. I'm, I'm switching some things up. And I freaked out and I said, no, put it back on the menu. I like that dish. You want to know why I freaked out? Oh, I can't wait to do this part. It's because I didn't know what was going to be on the menu. I didn't know that Matt and Tess Mullet would move here from Columbus, Ohio. I didn't know that Chase and Allie Godwin and Stacy Godwin would move down here from Appleton. I didn't know that, that Nate Wood was going to be on the menu. Josh Atkinson would be on the menu. Troy Altman would be on the menu. I didn't, I, we, at that point, we had not even met Kyle and Rachel Norris. They are our kids' directors right now. I didn't know that they were on the menu. There are people that God is taking off the menu in your life because they are not fit for the future he's walking in. It doesn't make them bad. You don't got to spit on them as you walk by, but they, they, ain't, they don't, they don't got a purpose anymore. There are, there are people that God is bringing into your life, and as long as you hold on to what he's calling you to let go of, you won't be able to embrace what he's trying to help lead you with. Because there's some people in your life, get this, that you need some people that don't know all the stuff about your past. Because they're jaded towards you, and they can't deal with it. They aren't evidencing and using the grace and the full grace of God towards your life. All right, letting them go. Because this is where I'm at right now. And I need some fresh perspective. And although you do know about little Jacob and he was 20 years and now he's got a church. Oh my goodness. That's fine. I'm going to let you go and I'm moving forward. There's some things that we got to let go. I love, I love what, what John Bevere says this. He says that, um, that, 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 that um, the enemy of God things is not necessarily bad things. It is the good things that we refuse to let go. Let it go. Let it go. And yet, the writer of Hebrews does mention that there are some things that, whether in season or out of season, are not good for you. Clench your ab muscles right here. He calls it sin. He says we got to let go of the, the sin so easily it snares us and entangles us and trips us up. And the crowd goes silent. Because this is, this is, this is maybe the word that, that why you, like, come back to church today, this is the word that turned you off about church. Because you had someone get up here and point at you and say, this is your sin. Yep, I saw your Facebook post last Wednesday. Boom, all right, gotcha. You got that? Go on, get where. Uh, and I'm not about to leverage this platform to try to somehow point out what your sin is. You got yours, I got mine. But I, you probably don't need that type of assistance because here's the deal. Sin is, uh, in this text is, is an archery term. It means to miss the mark. And I would imagine, I don't got to point it out for you. I don't, I don't think you need that type of help. I bet you if you took five minutes and had one honest conversation with God, you'd be able to pick up pretty quick what's missing the mark in your life. One way to spot sin in our lives is, is um, by, by doing an inventory of of what our actions are producing. Another, another scary verse that, that is oftentimes used to bash people on the head with is the wages of sin is death. Scary. You bring death into the equation? Okay. The wages of sin is death. The payment, the earnings, the, 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 the fruit, the produce of sin is, is always death. Sin wants to kill whatever it can get his hands on. Sin. Sin manifests itself in broken relationships. In a bitter heart. Sin manifests itself in, in, in going through an identity crisis. Sin, sin manifests itself sometimes, you know, in having a, a life that's just full of, of lies. Sin wants nothing more but to kill your faith and destroy your family. And you might have heard in the past that you got the wrong impression because then we got sin and then we got this God, this angry God. And I'm trying to comp comprehend, you know, God's feelings towards sin. And, and I want to let you know today that, that, that to clear the story really, that God is so passionately against sin, not because he's disappointed with you. Not because he's mad at you. Not because he's holding a grudge. Here is why God is so passionately against sin. It is because sin wants to destroy 
what Jesus died for to save. God is so passionately against missing the mark because it's, it's trying to kill us. It's trying to kill how we parent our kids. It's trying to kill how we view our lives. It's, it's trying to kill our job situation. It's sin. And the writer is saying it's time to let it go. And so this year, I think it would all do us some good to level up by letting some things go. To let go of some pride. Let go of some people. To let go of some unmet expectations. To let go of some, some broken dreams in our past that there's been too many times, y'all, that I have cried out to God to free me from something that I was really holding on to. But this is the year to level up and let it go. We're circling the runway as we approach our third point. And it's this, is that we need to be motivated. Y'all ain't coming in here. Stop trying to open the door. <laughs> you need to be motivated to refocus. He says this, let, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Give me that verse if you could real quick, please. And, and it says, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run the race um, that God has set before us. Next verse. Um, so that, and we do this, here it is, here we do. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. We do this by making Jesus our aim. We, we do this by setting the crosshairs on Christ. I played basketball um, all throughout middle school and high school. And I know what you're all wondering. How did you not go pro, Jacob? I had to let it go. I had to let go of that dream. I had to let it go. God had something else in store for me. Okay. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. But I'm, I'm here, you know. And I had some, some, um, some coaches, some good coaches, some bad coaches. But you know what? Like, not one coach, the good coaches or the bad coaches, ever, like, came into um, a, a, a halftime meeting or, or cast a, a, you know, um, a big speech at the beginning of the game and said, guys, bring it in. Here's, here's, here's kind of what I've been thinking about this week, all right? Here's what we want to do to today, man. We just, we don't want to mess up. Guys, tonight, we're not missing the mark, okay? And so, on three, don't be a loser. One, two, three. What I hear time and time again, eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the goal. Jacob, you're not even looking at the rim. <laughs> we're going somewhere, and I'm going to keep my eyes on it until I get there. You want to know how to get some clarity on which things you need to let go of in your life? Give Jesus your focus. A lot of times we're trying to figure too much stuff out. Figure too much stuff out. Figure stuff is good, it's good, it's good, it's good. It's good. But, but, but there's a powerful thing that happens when you just put your faith in Jesus and you say, God, I'm looking at you. Point to it. I'll let it go. You want some clarity for how to let go of which, what those, those good things? Because I bet there's some good things in your life. There's some good things in my life. Got to get my eye on the, the God thing. I need to start figuring out what that looks like in my day to, to set my focus on Jesus. And everyone's different. Everyone's different, got different methods. Some, it's, it's right off the bat, waking up. And I'm, I'm, I got to get my focus on Jesus. And so I'm working through this version Bible app devotional. And I'm just, I need to set my focus on Jesus. Because I bet you all that there's going to be some struggles that are going to happen today. And I want to start interpreting those things as it pertains to where God's taking me. As it pertains to the promise of God. As it pertains to Jesus who finished off my faith. As it pertains to Jesus who already won the battle for me. Man, God, I would really, really ask, Lord God, you'd help me see what I'm about to go through today through the eyes what did it say think about what Jesus already went through do you want to know how to let go of some sin in our lives it is not by don't sin 
Do you want to put that on repeat on your voice memos in your phone? I can do it for you. Stop it! That ain't, that ain't gonna help. I'm gonna hit the bullseye by trying not to miss. I ain't an archer. I don't think that's how it works. But rather, God, you've got my focus. Now show me what's missing. God, you've got my aim. Now show me what, show me God. And even if it hurts me, even, even if, it, if, it, if, it, if it starts to shake who I thought I was, even if it's been something that I've had with me since I was a child, and I know I'm not gonna beat it today, and I know it might take a season to overcome this, God, but I'm ready to let it go. Because I don't know about y'all, but I want a faith that runs, runs freely. I'm so sick and tired of going through seasons of my life when I'm trying, I'm still running just as hard, but I'm not getting as far because of what I'm holding on to. Oh man, if we had a church that would run the race that God has set before us with just a little bit less weight and a little less sin in our lives, man, that's the type of church. It's not a perfect church. Galatians 5, 8 says, it says that if we don't give up and we don't give up, the harvest is coming. God's gonna show up if you don't give up. It doesn't talk about being perfect. It does, so this is not a message, let me clear it up. This is not a message about go and be perfect. This is a message about keep going, keep going, take it off, take it off, keep going, keep going, take it off, take it off. We got limited time today because we do need to get out of here so that we wanna respect the school. And so I'm gonna take a second here and I'm just gonna pray for us. And um, I'm gonna be honest with you, you ain't conquering nothing in this moment probably. Like whatever you're dealing with, whatever has been latched onto you and you have not yet let it go, you're probably not gonna do that right now in this moment, maybe. I believe God can do it, but probably what needs to happen in this moment is we just need to take a second and start a conversation with Jesus. Don't try to take it all on yourself. You ain't starting any habits right now. So don't even try. How about we just start a conversation with Jesus? Father, we want to give you free reign in our lives. God, we are open to what you want to speak over us. We are open to your correction. Your word says that, that you discipline those you love, that you pull people back that you're trying to protect. Sometimes you poke us and it hurts and it pains, but, but it was the only way for us to get the message of what was killing us because we'd become numb to the wound. And right now, oh, good Lord, you're putting your finger in it and it hurts so much, but you're saying, we got to deal with this. You've been dealing with it way too long on your own. How about you get me in the mix? Help us with that, God, this week. I pray that you would create divine moments, Father, where you would remind us, not of my word, but of your word, Lord, that there are some things we gotta strip off. There's some sins we need to let go of. There is a race before us, and you are the author and the finisher of it, God. You are the starter. You're the closer. And that's why we go into this week with full boldness, Father, because it's just our job to run it. It's our job to live it, to experience it. We pray this, God, in your name. If you believe in that, would you just put your hands together and give God praise? Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Brave Church Podcast. It is our mission to help you move forward in the life that you are meant to live. And so we certainly hope that today's message encourages you, inspires you, and challenges you. We also want to give you an opportunity to respond to God's word and what God is doing in your life by financially contributing to Brave Church. Because of your financial generosity, the mission of Brave Church is able to move forward, and we are so grateful. You can give online today through www.bravechurch.tv slash give, or you can text to give by texting your amount to the number 84321, and then it will prompt you for some more information. Be blessed by today's word.